Welcome to Lecture 9, Point Cloud Processing. Most of Point Cloud Processing is going to be done through the Point Cloud Library. This is an amazing open source library that has incredible amounts of functionality and it's always growing. You'll be able to um, look into this exciting uh, piece of, of code and, and learn how to do uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things with point clouds. Our um, chapter and class is focused on studying basic functionality, but incrementally doing more complex things. After you finish this lecture, you'll have strong foundations to dig in and learn uh, more about PCL on your own from um, the website, which you can reach on this link. We're going to start with a simple demonstration on how to create a point cloud, um, how to save it to file, and how to uh, display it in RViz. Before we start, let me share this visual with you in order for you to become more familiar with the kinds of types of points that we can have in a point cloud. Number one. We can have a two-dimensional point cloud where we have an X and Y uh, position for a point cloud. So this this would just uh, be able to, to say, here's a point at this XY location. We can extend that to three dimensions and get an XYZ point, all of which are floats. We can also get an XYZ RGB uh, where <clears throat> basically you can declare not just the point but also the color. Um, nowadays, however, this RGB is mostly declared as a single float. We also have one where you have XYZ and then intensity. The intensity you can think of as a grayscale image where, where you, you're getting uh, low values are black, high values are white, and so you get a, a, some idea uh, about the intensity uh, of a point. We can also do normal, as in normal vectors. This is useful when you want to know um, the direction um, of a plane. So planes are described by normal vectors perpendicular to the plane. So this would form uh, <coughs> the vector elements of the normal and, uh, and give you some information about uh, the surface. Um, there's also this uh, point of this value for curvature if you get a zero value, it means you're on a flat surface. And then as that number increases, it signals that you're at a point where there's a lot of curvature. To look at these classes and all other functions, please refer to, a P to the PCL API, which you can find at this documentation website. Uh, one more note on basic types. Uh, the most uh, basic class for the point cloud is PCL point cloud. But this is a templated class, so it can be instantiated with different types. It's similar to sometimes the way we work with vectors. We can have vectors of ints, or vectors of doubles, or vectors of floats. Here we're going to have an instantiation of a point cloud that can be an XY or an XYZ or an XYZ RGB type. And so we have different instantiations of this templated class. One note about the point XYZ class, or the point XYZ type, I should say, is that these uh, points can be ordered or unordered. What does that mean? In the header, uh, we'll have a frame ID. This will indicate uh, to which frame of reference points are associated with. So it might often be the camera, but it could also be the world. And then we have a height and a width uh, for those points. Anytime that we have a height equal to 1 and a width equal to the number of points, that is what we call the unordered point cloud. And so we don't, we don't know the structure, but we just have the points and we have their values. Ordered point clouds might come um, might have the, the format of a sensor array. So let's say you're using a connect 
and the resolution is 640 by 480 so maybe the width and the height would have those values and we would refer to that as an ordered point cloud this type then has a header uh, with a frame ID a height and a width and then we have a point structure <coughs> or a point structure and inside of that we have a X element which is a float a Y element and a Z element similarly we have a point XYZ RGB and we have this RGB number here which is additional to the XYZ and it's also a float click on those links for more information um, we're also going to be learning how to do conversions between ROS types and PCL types in this package PCL utils uh, we have all the algorithms that we're going to be using uh, for PCL so uh, this package has some dependencies particularly uh, for raw CPP which is our main programming language here in the book but also for sensor messages especially because uh, we're going to be using the point cloud 2 sensor message description quite a bit okay this is similar to what we saw before we have our header with our frame ID we have a height and a width and shortly we're gonna look at what all this information looks like um, we'll have that dependency there then uh, we have this PCL ROS dependency the PCL ROS package is going to be the bridge between PCL and ROS. So this link is uh, taking us over here to this page that will give us a detailed description of the functionalities. So you can see this this works as an interface stack or as a bridge and it'll help us to uh, work with ROS nodelets, uh, nodes and interfaces. This header is a critical header for the bridge and one thing that it'll allow us to do is even publish and subscribe uh, PCL point cloud types which are not ROS types but it'll allow us to publish them and subscribe to them as ROS native types. When we use them however they, they show up as sensor messages sensor messages point cloud 2 to other nodes and this will be useful when we visualize with Arvis. So some examples down here uh, so that'll be an important node and then PCL conversions is uh, the package where we have methods that allow us to go from do conversions between PCL and ROS so we can go from PCL to ROS or back. We start section 8.1 with two pieces of code. Really, it's one program. The main program is called Display Ellipse. Um, Display Ellipse will actually call this CPP, which contains one function, and it's going to basically build a cloud. It's going to do it by actually populating two point clouds, one just with positions, the other one with positions and colors. It will create an ellipse and it will draw many layers of that ellipse across a range of Z values going from a Z minimum to a Z maximum and changing the color of those points as we go up. Then display ellipse uh, continues to save the point cloud to file and eventually publish it through the ROS system and visualized in our vis. We'll start with makeclouds.cpp. We can open that file right here using pclutils makecloud.cpp. Now most of this uh, code I will just directly refer to in the presentation but do please spend some time with the code itself. We're gonna the overview of the code is we include all the PCL types, the ROS sensor messages point cloud 2, and some conversion headers. Immediately 
after that, uh, we're going to create two local PCL types to hold just one single point. So it's going to be a point cloud XYZ and a point cloud XYZ RGB. After that, <coughs> we need to define uh, what the basic color of the points will be. So we define the coloring scheme here. And then we'll change that as we go through some for loops as we go up uh, the z values. We need to provide exact x, y, z positions for each point. So we do a for loop from 0 to 2 pi and uh, generate positions that will form this ellipse. Uh, we do that for x, y, z points and then we do that for x, y, z RGB points. <coughs> so within uh, MakeCloud, actually let me just show you how we start right here. <coughs> um, we will have this PCL point cloud templated by this type, point XYZ, and ROS allows us to extend a definition to become a pointer. So this is basic cloud pointer. Uh, we like pointers with point clouds so that we don't have to do a big copy of the point cloud structure. That's important because these point clouds can be large. They can have tens or even hundreds of thousands of points in them. And it would be uh, a big computational load to copy them across functions multiple times. Uh, the other argument is a point XYZ RGB, also a pointer. And we call that the point cloud pointer. <coughs> Inside this function make cloud, we're going to create a simple PCL point XYZ. <coughs> Notice this is not PCL point cloud, but just point XYZ. This point XYZ only holds one point and holds the XYZ positions for one point. Similarly, the PCL point XYZ RGB only holds one point, and this one holds the XYZ and RGB floats values for that point. We will basically compute one point at a time and then feed it to the larger structure, this, these two right here, which actually have a point uh, array inside of them. If I go back to the terminal and I'll do a ROS message show, You'll see uh, down here, um, now this is not exactly the PCL type, but you'll see that for, um, for the data, we basically have an array, also equivalent to a C++ vector. So in the PCL native type, this it will be points, not data, and we can have as, as many as we wish. So we're going to take that basic point and push it back to the larger structure. We'll also need to encode color <coughs> in the PCL point basic type. Color is encoded as a 4-byte float. So this 4-byte is important and uh, it implies that it also has 4 sections of 8 bits each or 32 bits total. And the standard assumption is that the first byte, bits 0 to 7, will contain blue information. So why, why 8 bits? Uh, because in color, one of the basic color spaces is RGB. And each of those colors can have up to 256 intensities. So these 8 bits can represent those intensities from 0 to 255. That's uh, why we have these intensities like this. The second byte, which is bits 8 to 15, will be green. And the third byte, um, 16 to 23, will be red. You'll notice that we still have empty bits from 24 to 32. But those will remain empty for a reason. Now, <coughs> to when we use bits in C++, you'll often be interested in bitwise operations in order to move or shift those bits around, click on this link for a basic tutorial. 
We'll also be using static cast and reinterpret cast to change types. I click on those links, especially this one on typecasting, uh, to learn more about what how they work. So the basic code uh, looks like this, and I will give you an illustration uh, on the next slide to clarify this a little bit further. Here we create a red u int 8. So this int 8 means 8 bits, and it's unsigned such that we don't have any, any negative values, and the 8 bits can just be used uh, for, for all positive values, which would go from 0 to 255. <clears throat> this value of 255 is the highest intensity we can have for a red, so that would give you a bright red. Green and blue are both, uh, both contain the value 15, which are darker greens and darker blues. We'll have a for loop that says z will go from negative 1 to 1 in intervals of 5 centimeters. Um, and then in this for loop, we're going to do uh, numerous things. But the first thing that we're going to do <coughs> is get a float, a float number for an RGB representation. How do we do that? Well, first, we take the red, the green, and the blue value, and we do the bitwise shifting that I mentioned right here. So, for example, blue will have no shifting. Green will be shifted by 8 bits so that it can start at this position. Red will be shifted at this uh, 16 bits and start at this position. <clears throat> Once we do that, we want to transform um, red, green, and blue from a U and Tate to a U and 32. And then what we'll do is we'll use these uh, operators right here to concatenate the three values, filling the UN32, and then converting this from a UN32 to a float. Now let's take a look at this slide um, to help you understand how this works a little bit better. So due to historical reasons, XYZ RGB has color represented as a float. <coughs> so imagine that your UN8 for blue and green and red looks like this. Uh, instead of 8 bits, I just have drawn 2 to facilitate the illustration. The first thing that we do is we do a static cast on them and convert them into uint32s. So basically, we still have the same value right here on, on our first bit, 0, 1, and 1, 0, and 1, 1, but we've basically increased the size of our type from 8 bits to 32 bits. The next thing that we want to do is concatenate them and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and shift the bit values. So currently, we say, here's my, my blue. It has no shift. So my, my 0, 1 is just it's going to stay there. Or this whole representation is, is right here. Uh, my green, I'm going to shift you know, by some number, in this case, 8 bits. So there's the shift right here. We place that number over there. We would still keep the whole thing, but we've we've shift. We still keep these three numbers uh, because as we shift them, that that's what we have. And then finally, red gets shifted by 16 bits. So this 11 comes eight 16 positions over here, and then we get this representation. Once we have done the shifting, we can concatenate which is just basically or these together. And so we get the blue right here, the green right here, and the red right here. This is a UN32 representation of four bits, which is exactly the same size as our float. Floats are also, sorry, four bytes or 32 bits. That's why we, we've chosen this particular dimension for the unsigned int. And then we're going to use something called the reinterpret cast that allows us to convert from one class to another unrelated class. So casting from a UN32 to a float. Click on those links uh, to see more. <clears throat> so once we've encoded color, we have a second for loop. And this time, we are 
moving around the ellipse, starting with uh, an angular value of 0, going to 2 pi, and then going up by increments of 2 pi divided by 72. Here we're going to uh, set the x, y, z locations of the points, and we use this equation um, for the ellipse. 0 0.5 times cosine of the angle for x and the sine of the angle for y. z is simply the, the z value that we have set in our for loop. Okay, so once we, we, we have this basic type only with xyz information, we then want to push, call pushback on points uh, to insert this information into our larger structure called basic cloud pointer. Now remember, basic cloud pointer is a pointer, so any uh, member of that class would be accessed by the arrow operator. And because points is treated as a C++ vector, we can call any method that is part of the vector class. And so we, we push back this basic point. Then we repeat the process with the point variable, which is not only XYZ, but also RGB. And so here we assign the RGB float number that we had into point RGB. Then this marks the completion of one point, which then allows us to push that back into the second uh, large structure point cloud pointer. And so as we go through that for loop, any time that we have a new z value, whether it's less than 0 or greater than 0, we're going to either decrement red and increment green here, or decrement green and increase blue here. And so that is going to change the color. The la once we finish those for loops, we just have one more thing to do, which is assign the width, the height, and the frame ID. Here for the width, uh, we can extract the number. We're going to do an unordered uh, point cloud. So all we need to do is get the size of points. This is a method that also comes from the vector class. And so this just returns the number of points that we have and casted that into an int. For height, uh, we will just uh, hard code that to a value of 1. And the frame ID will be set to camera. Now remember this frame ID because whenever we want to visualize these points in RVIS, this is a frame ID that we'll be needing to use. Okay, and just a note about unordered uh, point clouds. When the height is equal to one, we don't have an associated mapping to a 2D array. Uh, so it's just a bucket of points. Let's move on to the other part of our code, which is display ellipse. For this one, we can open in this way. And in this code, uh, we have a main function where we're going to make a call to make clouds. But notice that make clouds was defined in an external uh, file. So that requires us to include the prototype for main clouds before calling main, but also calling that uh, or using the extern directive, which tells the compiler to look in the local folder outside of this file for the definition of this function. OK, so we define that prototype. We have main. Within main is where we create those two PCL types that will pass to make clouds, and then which make clouds will in turn fill up. And after we have that, we can save them to file, convert them to a ROS type, and then publish. Okay, so now here we're going to look at the dynamic allocation of two point cloud types. So, so here we have a point cloud with a template point XYZ. We make that a pointer. And as before, we use the same name, basic cloud pointer. But to allocate memory for this, we use the new operator. And we say PCL point cloud PCL point XYZ. 
So this is a way to assign memory to the point cloud. We want to do it dynamically because we don't know the size of the point cloud at compile time. So by doing it here, we're just as, uh, assigning the right amount. When we call my clouds, we're going to update these two pointers. They will have the, f the, the cloud points that we have created. And immediately after that, <coughs> we can call this input output class save pcd file ascii function and provide a name uh, for the file and then a dereference pointer uh, variable uh, to save the actual information. Once we save the file, we want to publish uh, to the ROS graph. The first thing we need to do is create a ROS uh, point cloud 2 message. So we use this declaration here. And then we use this conversion method, PCL to ROS message. This will require the dereferenced pointer data and then the ROS type in this way. Once we have done this, ROS Cloud is ready to be advertised and published. So we advertise through the pub cloud object and then call publish on a continuous while loop uh, to get that uh, point cloud to, to the ROS graph. A note about compiling. To use PCL, our CMake list needs two particular steps. So if we open our CMake lists file, you'll notice that right here on the top, we have these two directives. The first one says, find package PCL 1.7 required. What this line does is it's going to return build flags and dependency flags that are necessary for the use of PCL 1.7. Now, all of these flags are in defined or included in CMake configuration files with extension .pc. For a system level installation like PCL, you're going to find those CMA configuration files with the following path opt ros indigo lib package config pcl ros.pc. I want to show you what they are because it's good for your understanding. So this is the path, and then if you want to find any of those configuration, uh, files for PCL, you can uh, type it like this and double tab. You'll get all the different possibilities like this. And then we can use something like Emacs to visualize it. What we see here is we have the definition of compile flags and lib flags. Uh, this kind of um, setting is what you would find in a make file. We have the first flag, dash i, which means uh, we are going to define include folders. So we have this one, opt ros indigo include. We have user include. We have user include eigen3. User include pcl1.7. User include ni. And user include vtk. For libraries, we have this flag, which says look for libraries at this location. Then we have the little l, <coughs> which says also use this specific library, PCL ROS filters, and all the rest. And so for, for a library like that, if we go to opt ROS indigo lib, you'll see that uh, here we, we will have a bunch of libraries. 573 to be exact. And then if we want to see the ones that are that start with PCL, we'll see that, for example, we have lib PCL ROS filters right here. So it is this file that is defining the include and library flags for the dependencies and then create some CMake variables from that. That's where the second line comes in when we say let's include PCL include directories, this is a variable that will include 
uh, all of the paths that we just saw from, from this file and allow us to access them through this easy macro. Okay, so now let's take a look. Uh, let's run and display the node. Here we'll need ROS core first, and then ROS run PCL utils display ellipse. Oops, one second. Sorry, that happened because I was in the OPT folder, which is a root level folder, so I was not allowed to do that. But once I changed my uh, path to a normal path, uh, there was no problem. So once I, I call this, it says generating example point cloud ellipse. We can view it in Arvis. Uh, the topic is ellipse, and the fixed frame should be set to camera as we set that in our code. So we can open Arvis in this way and uh, have these particular settings for it. So over here, we can choose camera. In fact, if you click on this menu, you won't see anything. The reason for that is we don't have a URDF file. We don't have a robot description uh, parameter. And so there's no frames. But it's important to, to use this fixed frame to visualize the point cloud as that is the frame we used in the point cloud type. Then you can load a point cloud display like this one and adjust the topic to ellipse. As soon as we see, as we do that, we can zoom in or out and we'll see that we have this basic ellipse shape. It's flashing uh, because we're public publishing at a particular rate, so we are getting new points, even though they're not moving, but we're getting new points every time. But writing points to cloud, let's make a couple of notes. Uh, we can save points to file with two formats. The first one is a binary format, and for that we would use this function called save PCD file binary. This is the most compact representation but the downside is it's not easy to view. The second one is using the ASCII format. In terms of size, this file will be twice as large as the binary format. Again, if you're saving many of these images, this is a consideration because they are large, uh, large files. The ASCII format also has a bug in the color representation that corrupts the color, so it has another downside but they can be visualized easily with any text editor. So if I go back here to the location where I ran my code, you'll see that this was uh, the file with which, uh, with this is the file that we saved from our program. So this can be visualized uh, using something like Emacs. <coughs> And this is what the ASCII file looks like. Now let's take a look at some more information. Uh, here we, we get some fields. Um, the file uh, describes fields that are included in this type. So we have an XYZ and an RGB field, four in total. These individual fields are four bytes each. So that's the size of the float. And that's why we have this F right here. We only have one field of these kinds. So the, this is what number one represents. And in terms of width, we have 2,920 points and just a height of one representing the unordered point cloud. So the total number of points is right here. And the format is ASCII. How do we make sense of this data? So this is uh, the first X, Y, and Z point right here, and the first RGB color. If you remember, uh, when we start with an angle pi of 0, then 0 0.5 times the cosine of 0 is 0 0.5. This is the sine of 0, which is 0. And the height for the Z value starts at negative 1. 
In fact, all of these points at the beginning will have that minus one height before we switch. Color is a little bit harder to understand because this was the encoding of three out of four bytes that were converted from UN32 to a float value. So they're hard to, to make sense. That's all for section 8.1. See you later.